as you know, we are here to answer your questions, and we've got a great selection this week. But if you want your question answered, all you need to do is leave it in the description below using that hashtag GTN Coaches Corner, and we could be answering your question next week. And finally, before we do crack on, just a quick reminder to click on the globe and the bell icon so you get notified of every new video that we put out. And now, time for those questions. The first one from Kelly C. Hi, GTN. I was just wondering about whether you thought it would be a good idea to replenish electrolytes after training swims. I usually figure that the water keeps me pretty cool and I'm not sweating much during a swim, but the water temperature in my local pool has swung from a frigid 77 Fahrenheit or 20 degrees centigrade last week to a bath-like water of 87 Fahrenheit, 31 degrees centigrade, making me rethink that assumption. Um, well, Kelly C, yes, you are on it because mm. at that temperature, you are most certainly going to be sweating. And if you ever see swim squads, it was something that I just did out of habit. I always had my water bottle on poolside. I never really thought about it. It was just ingrained. But obviously, the coaches know what they're talking about because, yes, it is a very hot environment. If you ever sat on poolside, you will know how hot and humid it is. And if you were doing any other exercise in hot and humid conditions, you would most certainly be concentrating on your rehydration during and after and even before making sure that you're hydrated and swimming is no different yeah your body doesn't actually know it's in water so when it gets a heat load from working hard in the water it's going to sweat that's how it deals with heat so it's going to sweat you might not feel it sweating you might get sweat running down your face because you're in water so you can't tell but you are sweating you are losing those electrolytes and you are losing those fluids and you do need to replace them you don't necessarily need to do it in the session while you're going but yes immediately afterwards you should be replacing those electrolytes and and hydration so that you can recover for the next swim or the next session so yeah good question and definitely pay attention to that hydration uh, moving on uh, toby streams asks hashtag gtn coaches corner uh, this channel has a lot of info on stride length but how about stride width is stride width important and if so how wide should we stride a watch me stride. Thanks a ton. Okay. Uh, yeah, that is true. We do mostly focus on stride length and we talk about stride length and getting your stride length right because you don't want to be over striding uh, because it will definitely slow you down. You don't also want to be uh, taking two small steps and under striding because that's not very efficient. Uh, what you do want to be doing though, and when he's talking about stride width, is making sure that yours is right for you. Now, stride width actually hasn't been studied that much. Uh, people generally come with their natural stride width, uh, which is decided by the hip angle and their flexibility, etc. Uh, and no one really challenges it or changes mm. it really. However, there have been some studies that have proven that a narrow stride width can increase the chances of RTB problems and increase the chances of uh, shin injuries like shin splints. Uh, and therefore, there have been some studies on whether you should try and change it or improve it. Now, for most people, it is not something you need to improve unless you are consciously correcting it or consciously over uh, crossing your legs. So essentially running on a line. And you can check this just simply by running down the white line in the road. And if you're running uh, one foot in front of the other one and you're pronating into that, uh, you maybe want to think about widening your stride slightly uh, to make sure your feet are landing kind of on either side of that white line or at least on either edge of that white line uh, to make sure that you're not n crossing your legs over because that angle will make you hit the ground slightly uh, and optimally, unoptimally, is that yeah. a word? Uh, yeah, and it, that can cause injuries over the long term. Uh, it's not something you need to correct. If you do need to correct it, mostly what you need to look at is your actual hip and, and uh, your hip strength and your hip flexibility to make sure that you're not pulling yourself inwards. Uh, there are some exercises you can do, such as uh, squats, uh, squats with an elastic band around your knees where you hold your legs out, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but it's not something that you really need to focus on. Most people shouldn't even need to think about it. You do need to focus on your stride length though. Yeah, I say this only like you say, if there's something that's actually going wrong with your mm. running, it shouldn't really even enter your psyche. And then even so, I would address all those other issues before you start looking at that because it's just not something that's in our psyche to be able to think, how would I change that? So Yeah, um, I think if you consciously try and change it just mm. by, I'm going to run wider, you're going to start bouncing left and right and it's not yeah. actually going to improve anything at all. It's not something you can consciously change it's something that you might have to change your flexibility and your strength of your glutes etc to correct but like we say there's a lot of other things you can change before that to prevent injuries so don't uh, jump straight into playing with your stride width unless you have pre-existing issues yeah 
All right, moving on. George Westall has this question. So, I've entered my first international triathlon next October. Challenge Mallorca as a focus on training while I'm working in the Falklands from June until the end of September. I will mostly have to train indoors, maybe a few runs outside. I am after advice of how to set up my strategy from training indoors in a cold environment to racing in hot conditions with a short two weeks in the UK between getting back from the Falklands and going to Mallorca. Any advice, please? Well, George, um, first of all, I think I just want to kind of question whether you've been to Mallorca before. Um, for those of you know, those viewers who don't know Mallorca, it's just an island just south of Spain. And in October, it can be really hit or miss with the weather. And I've been there in October and in March, and it's been really warm, but it's also been raining at that time of year. So Yeah, yeah even in October, I mean, even on a good day, you're probably looking at maybe mid 20s. Chances are it might even be cooler than that, low 20s or even below 20. So it's not corona level heat that you have to deal mm. with here so it is that much easier to simulate it and get ready with for it before you get there uh, now you're two weeks in the uk before you go out there uh, definitely in october are not going to help you <laughs> acclimatize in any way you are going to have to simulate that heat uh, and that's not that hard to do actually we made a video on on adapting to the heat and heat training and you can watch that we'll give you some advice briefly here now we'll tell you uh, you simulate it basically indoors you both need to simulate the the temperature but also the humidity if you can uh, you can just use a space heater and a wet towel to, to in in a, a small enclosed space uh, you can create a small enclosed space if you want to like we did with these uh plastic garden tents it works quite well actually uh, but you do need to simulate it you need to adapt to it but once you have adapted to it so with a few sessions uh, you can actually keep that adaptation for quite a long time so i think what he probably is worried about is if he does do something mm. in the falklands uh, to prepare he won't be able to do that for two weeks in the uk he's going to lose all that adaptation and then uh, he's going to go to mallorca unadapted that's not actually the case you will hold that heated adaptation for quite a long time and you can keep it going almost indefinitely just with one or two exposures a week so you can do one hot session in a hot turbo room uh, once a week and you will keep that adaptation to heat so it's not something you need to worry about too much you do need to be conscious of it you do need to prepare for it uh, but you can definitely get ready for your race challenge Mallorca uh, in the Falklands yeah, it's actually probably quite ideal, the fact that you're doing most of your training indoors as opposed to outside. So I look at it as a positive and yeah, watch that video and you'll be sorted. Yeah. Okay, on to our next question. And it's from uh, Dave Stecker and he says, hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. I purchased my first direct drive bike trainer secondhand that came with a cassette that matches my road bike, but not my tri bike. I've started my off-season training with my road bike on the trainer and I'm loving it. My question is, will training on my road bike give me a different training adaptation because I'm not practicing in the aero position? Um, a pretty pertinent question at this time of year. Uh, and the answer is yes and no. So yes, you can train on your road bike. It's not going to uh, really affect you. Uh, it will not be the perfect adaptation or perfect preparation for your triathlon later on on your aero bars. But it will be good training and you can transfer that with just a few weeks in your aero bars as the season starts. All that fitness that you've built over the winter on your road bike will transfer into your triathlon bike and you'll be good to go. So don't not use your road, your road bike the whole winter, especially if you're enjoying it on the turbo. Anything that helps you enjoy your winter training is good as far as we're concerned. You want to enjoy your winter training as much as possible. If that means putting your road bike on the turbo, go for it. Uh, as you get closer to the season, start adapting, start putting a bit more time into your on your TT bars, uh, start getting out there on the road on your TT bars mm. uh, so that you're used to it for when the race comes because you can't do that, ex that change in the last week before your race, but in the last month or two, you absolutely can. So you've got a whole winter where you can be out there on your road bike or in your turbo on your road bike without any problem whatsoever. Yeah, I'd most certainly say, I mean, I personally would just leave my road bike on the turbo and then when it gets to the sort of nicer weather, the TT bike comes out and I go outside. If I do have my TT bike on the turbo, I don't really ride it in the aero, on the aero bars anyway because it's so uncomfortable <laughs> unless I've got, you know, the screen down there. So I wouldn't worry too much like James says and yeah, just enjoy being comfortable and it's more important that you're motivated and you want to go and get on that bike than worrying about position at this mm -hmm. early point. Definitely. Yeah. And our final question this week comes from Tiplak. Uh, it says, inspired by Heather's last man standing ultramarathon video a while ago, I signed up for a similar running challenge. Oh, this is cool. 5k laps starting every 30 minutes for a maximum total of 50k or five hours of running how do you pace such an event high pace long rests or slow and short rests well 
I can't and answer this at all because I've never done an event like that. So yeah, uh, that's all for Heather. I mean, to be like, your challenge is already harder than mine because 5K in 30 minutes, I only had to do two miles in 30 minutes initially, but then mine came down. So it was a little bit of a different strategy in the fact that I knew I was going to have to run faster later on. However, mm. I think I would still approach it in the same way of, and it was interesting because if, if you do watch that video, you'll have seen some people had different strategies of going out you know, much sort of faster and then having a longer rest or going really slowly and having a shorter rest. And I found that it's about just maintaining your legs and not burning too many matches. And if you're in a low zone, you're going to be able to keep going for far longer. So going nice and steady. That way you can also take on fuel during. Because you might think, oh, I haven't got time when I finish to get fuel on. But if you're just jogging and you're in that comfortable pace, then you should be able to take on hydration and fuel during it. You just maybe need to factor in a, a, a loo break if at some point you need that. So maybe you could go a little bit quicker. The only thing I would say is you start to get that ache after a while. And I know you've done an ultra recently and it's sometimes you just almost want the change of pace. And I don't know how flat this run is if you're running on the same surface, everything can get a little bit like it's sort of almost achy, like if you're standing on your feet all day. So you might want to just change your pace slightly. Also for the mental change, because it's going to be the mental challenge that will be the hardest part of this. Uh, trust me. I would definitely go with uh, as conservative as possible. But yeah, maybe buy in a little bit of time on one or two of the laps to make sure you can uh, recover, maybe go to the bathroom and make sure you get some fuel in. Uh, yeah, that's about all the advice I have. If you do want to watch that video, it's called Last Man Standing. Heather did, a, as she says, a pretty impressive feat there where she had to run multiple two-mile laps uh, and the time came down every time she finished. Uh, the Unique. next lap had to be a little bit faster. Uh, yeah, she... I missed that one because of COVID, <laughs> yeah. but uh, she, I she think definitely you were enjoyed relieved. it. Yeah, yeah. Not many people I was were relieved a little bit to have relieved COVID. To, to, yeah, it was <laughs> good timing. Yeah. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, uh, give it the like down below. And remember, you can leave your comments below any of our videos. Use the hashtag GTN Coaches Corner, and we could be answering your questions next week. Thanks for watching.